Hey guys, welcome into today's weekly movie update. So let's start off with the sad news of James Caan passing away at 82. He's got a lot of very strong performances in his background. Obviously things like Brian's Song, The Gambler, Misery, even Dogville. Um, particularly, I always watch him in Elf. Elf normally comes around in the Christmas rotation once a year. Um, but really, Thief is the one for me that I like a lot. The Michael Mann movie. He plays Frank in that. Just all around, I think it's an underrated Michael Mann movie. I think it deserves more attention. But obviously, The Godfather is the thing, playing Sonny, that James Caan is most known for. And I think if you go back through The Godfather, you see, you see that James Caan... Well, okay, not James Caan. You see that the character of Sonny is haunting the Michael character throughout the second movie, even throughout the third movie. I know Fredo's kind of the brother that most people kind of look to as like a legacy character, but James Caan's performance in The Godfather does such a good job of just carrying home the the power that the Sonny character has. You see it in Michael in, in just the way that he's not really supposed to, he was never meant to be in the position that he's in. In the first movie, particularly in the second movie, and then you see the fallout of all of that in the third movie. And it all goes back, even particularly in the third movie, looking back to Sonny uh, and dealing with the uh, Garcia character, how just how much he looms over the entire story. And a reason why it works so well is because James Caan gives a really immaculate performance in The Godfather. I know Pacino, Brando... Uh, even even the character who plays Fredo is kind of the ones that are kind of given the most attention. I think James Caan is as good as all of them. His character is really integral to the entire trilogy, and he does a very good job of, of rooting it in the first movie. So that came through yesterday. It wasn't really going to be the main focus of the show today, but kind of wanted to lead with that. Going on, the box office boom continues in a very, very encouraging way. The uh, the idea throughout the pandemic and even in like the last 12 months has been, ah, oh, theaters. Theaters, I guess they're just not going to make it. They're just not going to make it, guys. Uh, streaming is here. If streaming was ever going to destroy the theaters, it was going to be because we we're all forced to be at home. And most articles, even most people in theater administrations were kind of like, this sucks what's going on, that this is how the movie theaters are going out. But it really is looking more and more that that is just not the way that it's going to go down. Uh, the Rise of Gru, this 4th of July weekend, broke another record, well, broke a record. For 4th of July weekends, it's now made $125 million domestically, $219 million worldwide. And then you have Elvis, which so far has got $76 million, headed to pass $100 million. And in the first weekend that it came out, it tied with Top Gun which that was Top Gun's sixth weekend, and it was, Top Gun was still making enough money to tie a huge movie like Elvis after already being out for six weeks. Top Gun is, that is the, that's the mega one, though. It, it has made $1.1 billion worldwide as of last weekend. It is the 57th highest grossing movie domestically, and it's not looking to slow down. It actually just passed up Tim Burton's Batman. Uh, in terms of action movies, it's passed up The Dark Knight in terms of tickets sold. And I think that in terms of what's the secret to keeping momentum going to getting people to go to the movie theaters, uh, again, things like Top Gun, Elvis, and uh, Rise of Gru, we're not talking about things like Marvel, where you it's kind of installed that the audience is going to go again and again and again to the theaters to see everything that comes out. It's a bit more of a chance. It would make sense if Top Gun Maverick failed. It would make sense if Elvis failed. And it would make sense if Gru kind of flew under the radar. But... Word of mouth for all of this stuff seems to be, particularly with Top Gun, seems to really be the thing that is most at play. People just telling their friends and family that it's incredible. Whatever movie is the talk of the town, it has to be the talk of the town, because that is what gets people to go and see these movies. That's what Top Gun, that's what Top Gun did. Uh, Rise of Gru, I think that Minions just have a connection with young audiences. I don't know how much this whole... Uh, minion, gentle minions is really a craze that is uh, a cause for what's going on. It's a funny meme though. And, but with Elvis right now, Elvis seems to really have attracted the older crowd and just anyone that loves Elvis. But we'll see now that I think it's the second weekend now we're going into with this. We'll see if it does have the word of mouth power to get more and more people to go and see if it continues to grow, continues to grow in the theater. And then for the rest of the year, We'll see what is going to happen. The next test will be 
Bullet Train. We'll see if Bullet Train is going to make a lot of money. If that, I could see that doing a lot with Brad Pitt. Um, I don't know. I, I feel kind of halfway if that movie's going to be any good. But the big one's going to be the next Avatar movie. Obviously, Top Gun, I think, is probably going to be the one that takes the most amount of money right now for the year. Um, but if Avatar passes it up, we'll see. Avatar is still the highest grossing movie. It's something like $2.2 billion. So, I don't know. But Bullet Train and obviously Thor is out right now. And then Avatar, I think, are going to be the ones to see if this is re if theaters are really back. I think that'll be the thing that is the most encouraging, to see the, the year just end with constantly going to see movies. Okay, the next story is Stranger Things 4 has become the second most watched Netflix season ever, surpassing 1.15 billion hours viewed, second to Squid Games for 1.65 billion. Uh, the only thing interesting here, I think, is is Netflix really able, um, because of the troublesome year they've had, are they really able? Are they too big to fail, essentially? If they have this much attention from people on a regular basis, is someone not going to step in? And just keep Netflix going regardless of what bad might happen. Like, is it obvious that Netflix, through the boost throughout all of the pandemic stuff, was going to have a success? And then they were just, you know, they were just going to see a dip. You can't see just constant growth forever. So um, having Stranger Things come back and still be able to get this level of views is encouraging that Netflix is not really going to go anywhere. I think they need to have another hit that comes out that is very, more like a House of Cards type thing, something very original, something from America, something that is not rooted in nostalgia. I think if we can get a few of those, maybe two originals a year is what we might need in order for them to stay on top, keep subscribers coming back. Um, I, I think that the amount of attention that they still get, I don't, I don't, see, I just don't see how they'd be able to lose. Um, the streaming war, or even come in second place still. Even with all the discouraging signs, they still just have so many eyes on them. Um, but next story, Brian Cox, um, who plays Logan Roy in Succession, says he has a lot of respect for the Succession character, saying that it was very misunderstood. I just thought this was an interesting story because I've also always loved the Logan Roy character, and I know that the character is a dick, but there's just something about seeing somebody play kind of like this huge almost like Rockefeller type titan of industry that it, it, you kind of every time he talks about how he kind of sees the world in ways that people don't want to I think there is a side of him that is a little bit more endearing that people give that character credit for so I just like that he said that wanted to bring that to everyone's attention I thought it was interesting um next the actor from Stranger Things David Harbour said that a movie like Goodfellas couldn't exist in this climate with MCU domination and I thought this was interesting. He said, I don't see it as anything but entertaining, fun stuff. And obviously, he's also in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He said, when I was growing up, Goodfellas came out in the cinemas, and it was like the Captain America of its day. We all rushed out to see it. I don't know if those movies really can exist in this climate anymore, admitting that Marvel is just a smaller piece in a much larger cultural puzzle. And I do wonder if there's just oversaturation whenever it comes to the Marvel brand, if that is true. Obviously, if you're just looking at ticket sales, people still love going to see Marvel movies. And this might honestly, I feel like if we look back at Marvel, what is it going to be? I think it will probably be seen as, um, you know, maybe the best way to think about it. I've got a, I've, I've you know, I'm, I'm a freelancer. And most people that I've talked to that are also freelancers also own businesses. They pretty much say that what you need at the beginning is just a hold a level of clients that are coming in that is just a huge holding pattern it keeps it, it just pays all the bills keeps everything going they're they're essential because it's kind of the the thing that gets you through the the hard times particular and it will probably be seen uh, marvel will probably be seen as that the thing that was needed whenever the whenever hollywood wasn't really sure how to get butts in seats for new stories for things that were not just based on IP, they had Marvel to keep them afloat. And it was needed at that time. And whenever things were not great, whenever things like Nomadland, um, whenever things like Moonlight, whenever movies that weren't even made in America were winning all the awards, getting all the attention, that's kind of what was just needed at the time because it was a dry spell. And I think right now there is a bit of a dry spell that I hope we're coming out of with movies. And I think that the MCU will be there until it just isn't, until there's more exciting stories, 
more till people realize and remember how exciting the movies can be but obviously the industry has to be the one to show people that it's not just gonna happen so until then i think marvel's gonna dominate the conversation but i don't think marvel is gonna be seen as anything more than just you know an achievement of organization it's cool that they were able to do so many of these movies um that that's i think that's gonna be the way that it's seen in the end then avatar uh speaking of the movie that is going to give top gun a run for its money few headlines from james cameron this week james cameron says that he thinks that people need to start expecting longer run times and that people need to just be okay with going to pee in the middle of a movie um which is a little bit strange because obviously that doesn't even work he kind of referenced hey you're at tv you're at home and you're watching eight hours on your tv um it's like obviously i mean obviously you can just pause and go and do your biz and then come back like it's not it's not the same at a theater um, so I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I th- wish the way that he went and what I would love for him to do in this new Avatar movie is put intermissions back into movies. I think that would be the real way to go. Put intermissions back into movies. Give people, uh, first of all, I think intermissions are great. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia 2001 have great intermissions that work very well with kind of building tension throughout the movie. You get a nice kind of, you can jump in time in ways that you wouldn't normally be able to with an intermission. I think that um, I think that, that should be the thing that we kind of... I think on one end, the, the um, audience needs to be okay with watching three-hour movies, which we're getting a lot of now. So, you know, Batman was three hours. I think we would have been okay with an intermission in that. And I think it's okay. Avatar is three hours long right now. Put an intermission in. I don't think people would have a problem with that. But he did call out trolls. Uh, and he called them Avatar trolls for making fun of the length of the movie. He said essentially people, you know, make fun of it and then they watch the movie and then they shut the fuck up. Like, I I don't know. The first Avatar, I think most people make fun of it because the story's a little creaky. I mean, you, you spent so much time creating your own language and you couldn't come up with a name better than, what is it, unobtainium for the mineral that they're going to get. It's just, there's a lot of stuff in Avatar that I think is very silly. Um, but in terms of making fun of the runtime, uh, yeah, yeah, there's no need to make fun of the runtime. One story that i very excited in hearing more about this week, Michael Mann says that he is planning to expand the Heat cinematic universe with an upcoming sequel. Right now, Michael Mann is uh, kind of, he's released Tokyo Vice this year, and Heat 2 is actually a project that is coming out in August as a novel, first of all. Now, I love Heat. I feel like everyone... Particularly if you love crime, you love the Heat movie. Uh, the movie Heat, the Heat movie. Um, it's a very, very strong, it's a very strong film. Holds it very, very well. What we know right now about the novel, at least, is that it's going to be told in a Godfather 2 type of style. It looks to the past and the present. The thing that I'm worried about a little bit is that it will mainly focus on Chris, which is the Val Kilmer character. And Michael Mann has said what he either plans to make it a movie or a series... De Niro, De Niro and Val Kilmer are not going to return. Obviously, Kilmer can't really return. Um, and yeah, so De Niro can't return. Also makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's just, that's worrisome. That's a big leap to get other actors to be playing De Niro in, De Niro young, getting somebody to play Val Kilmer um, young and old. We, it, we'll see how it works, but I, that just makes me nervous hearing that. It makes me nervous hearing that. Then again, I mean, if you're going to tell a movie like Godfather 2, people were worried that Robert De Niro was playing a young Marlon Brando. They were saying there's no way you're going to be able to do that, and he does a fantastic job with that. So that's one to look out for. Michael Mann, I think, still has really good directing chops. Um, I'll talk about Public Enemy a little bit later because I saw that this week. I'd never seen that before. An interesting movie. But I, I think they could do something with it, but the casting thing, I think, is worrisome. I think that's a worrisome detail, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I would trust Michael Mann to maybe pull something off that's a little interesting. Uh, one business insider thing that I thought was interesting, someone named Jeff Sagansky says that the new streaming business model has to be relegated to the dustbin. He's a media investor. He's a producer. And essentially... People that work uh, as agents, people that work as producers, people as work as, that work as actors, they are, they're saying getting kind of cheated out of a bit of the profits on the back end of their deals. Uh, a thing they used as an example of this is the, whenever DVDs became big, 
whenever DVDs became big, they essentially said, hey, the studio said, we'll share 20% of the profits with, you know, actors, just everyone that's kind of working on the project. But then that became a multi-billion dollar industry. And most of the people that worked on the project said, we're now, we're barely getting anything. Like compared to what you're taking home, you're like, we're doing all this work and then you take home the lion's share of everything. They're saying it's essentially going the same way with streaming, saying if something's successful, we should share in the profits of what these streaming companies pull in. I, I honestly don't have a take on that. Um, I'm sure that the unions will cause quite a stir if that gets more traction. But just an interesting thing I want to bring to y'all's attention. Uh, last two things. Actually, I'll just say one more story. We'll skip the Amsterdam trailer. I didn't even have time to check it out. Um, Tom Hanks reacted to Tim Allen's light your absence, saying he does not understand that. Uh, just, I find it so annoying that most people, most people writing articles try to make the light year failure a political topic. I don't think it is. I think it is just a stupid thing to cast, to cast, especially a children's movie where the voice is such a big thing and then be surprised when people just have no interest because it's not the same character. If you don't have the same voice, it's not going to be the same character. Uh, the, in the Toy Story 2 movie, they had Tom Hanks play Woody in the TV show, and then he played Woody um, for The Voice, do the same thing with the character. I mean, there are so many people online that try and reason it away. It's like, oh, but it's not the same character. It's not It's not the same person. It makes perfect sense. I mean, sure, logically, you could say people that voice movies don't always voice the toys, but then again, it, it's also just stupid to bring like a real life business decision into the way the it's a movie. You see, you recognize the character with that voice. The guy's still around. Hire him for the new voice. I think, at the end of the day, that's going to be seen as the reason why that failed. And I think it's funny that Chris Evans then is kind of the one thrown under the bus because uh, he's kind of an asshole. That's all the news. I put a review up of Elvis. That's on the channel. Just a few uh, reviews. I saw Mad God recently. The new movie by Sam Tippett, I think his name is. Uh, a very famous animator. He's been working on this movie for a long time. It's got a very... Uh, it's a claymation movie. Stop motion movie. It is on Shudder. It is worth checking out if I would say you like movies from David Lynch um from Cronenberg there's no dialogue it is kind of just uh, an emotional piece of a uh submarine diver I forget the names of them a, a diver who is just kind of walking through a wasteland of the world it's it's an interesting watch it's an interesting watch if you like mood if you like dark mood also maybe a bit of George Miller in there it's an interesting movie if you really enjoy dark moods and environments in movies. I'd be interested to hear your take if you have seen it. Let me know what you think. I also saw Public Enemies, director Michael Mann, speaking of Heat. I had never seen it before. It is, I think, a very good story, an interesting story. I don't think they go in enough into the Purvis character, the Christian Bale character. And I also think that Michael Mann's obsession with that kind of DV-looking format does not work unless it's with Johnny Depp. For some reason... Johnny Depp just kind of, he's such a magnetic performer that any type of format that it's in, and it's an experimental format, he does kind of bring it in a bit. Every time the, the creepy close-ups they get of him, they work very well. But there's something about that DV format. It, it, it works whenever David Lynch is doing it because, obviously, if you watch a Lynch movie, you're, you know that you're working in a distorted environment, so it's fun to kind of get that extra layer of distortion. But it, it distorts so much of uh, so many of uh, the, the sets, the performances. I think it, it hurts Christian Bale's performance when he has to act with this weird behind the scenes looking footage. It makes so many sets look cheap. Um, so it's, it's an interesting story. I wish they had kind of beefed up Christian Bale's uh, character a bit more to the degree that you were able to get with um, John Dillinger's character and Depp's performance of him. But an interesting movie. Uh, it's on Netflix. I don't think it's on Netflix for much longer. So an interesting watch. Uh, I saw Finish Obi-Wan Kenobi. That is... I really want to like it a lot. But it is... It would not be worth a rewatch at all. Someone re-edited the Obi-Wan Kenobi sh series, which I guess is something like five and a half hours down to a two-hour movie. And I feel like that makes a lot more sense. But even still... I am very bored with Disney doing just the old mopey man trope. That's just very dull. The worst, I mean, George Lucas was not good with the prequels in terms of style, but he was actually able to put a story together that intrigued and felt like a real-life story. 
this new thing of just everyone is just kind of this mopey, sad person. It I, that's it works a bit. I think it worked great for Luke um, in Last Jedi. But they just do it all the time, and it's. I think it's lazy because they're doing it all the time. I think it's a little bit boring, and I wish they would kind of move beyond that characterization uh, because it doesn't feel like you're learning anything about about Obi Wan very much. Um, the most interesting thing about Obi Wan the series is that you are essentially bringing the Anakin character closer to Darth Vader to see that lapse. And I think they do a shitty job of it. I, I don't think I, I don't think that Hayden Christensen is a very good actor. Most of that as well is nostalgia that kind of allows him to not be laughed off of screen. Um, he, as Darth Vader, I guess I don't like this whole idea throughout all these stories that they're going to re- they're going to fill in all of the empty spaces in the coloring book. They're going to reveal all of the mystery, and I think it's just going to take away from it. You're going to end up watching all the best parts of Star Wars, and you'll have the full story. And if the full story sucks, then it's not going to matter anymore. You're going to make the whole thing kind of crappy. And I guess if that's what people want, then that's what they're going to get. But I think this is kind of just more of what they seem to be doing. They just want to put pump more stories out, even if it kind of lessens the mystery that makes all of the originals great. And also, like I've said before, I was not someone that was obsessed with Star Wars as a kid. I came to it whenever I was much older, so I'm not just looking at the older uh, areas and seeing like, oh, these were just the old ones. They're so magnificent. They're, They're all fine. They're all fine. Like, Empire Strikes Back is a very, very good movie. Um, Star Wars A New Hope is also fun. Uh, It's fine. But it's just, I don't know why they continue to put things out that kind of diminish what are the best parts of the property, other than just, you know, keeping the brand alive. Um, Finished Samurai Turn Pretty with Leanna. We finished that recently. That was fun. Also, towards the end of the show, if you're into the YA stuff, it does a good job of becoming, um, you know, just does a good job of bringing you the feeling of a summer so it's a fun show if you're into that type of thing then yesterday i saw fourth of july the new louis ck movie i'm thinking of doing a review of that for next week definitely worth watching the most interesting part about it and the thing i have to think about is just the relationship between separating the art from the artist because so many people online like critics are trashing this movie right now because they absolutely hate louis ck they hate that he's allowed to still exist and to a degree, there's a point to be made in there. I think they're bringing, going to the wrong conclusions about it. But just that whole idea of at what point are we allowed to forgive someone who does something? How do you determine that? And then how do you kind of bring them back into the fold? Because Fourth of July, I think, not without its faults, but has it's better than it has any right to be. So I would suggest checking it out. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to kind of break down what it is exactly, how, if at all, you should be thinking about character or character of the filmmaker in something like this. But I'll think about that later. It'll be a review for next week. I'm trying to do the reviews Wednesdays at 5 p.m. now. So um, if you want to check that out, be sure to subscribe to 5 Minute Critic for future updates on reviews and movie news.